Good morning. My name is Christina Keast, and I have the pleasure of being your service leader this morning. I will be joined by our minister, Reverend, Ro Reverend Rosemary Morrison. It's good to have you with us, whether in person or online. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy for so opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Let us let go, just for a time, of the everyday world. We'll quiet ourselves, our phones, and our devices, and create a space in this hour to simply be together. In the spirit of life and love, we gather. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude from our own Karen Mills. Thank you, Karen, that was lovely. Just what I needed, how about you, to let it go. So good morning, good morning. It was a little better than last week, but not much. Let's try it again. We're gonna wake you up whether you want to or not. I know it's gonna snow today, but it might. Are we happy about it, Gordon? Okay, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. That does my heart good. I'm so glad you're all here this morning, whether you're here in person or online. I'm just so glad you are here. And I wanted to say that if you're with us on Zoom, um, it might be nice to take some time and find a couple of candles so that you can join in in some of our rituals and, and things this morning. So I'm so glad that you have taken this time out of regular time to do something of worth together. Today we continue our exploration of the theme, Holding History. I'll introduce the Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison-Reed, former lead minister at our Toronto congregation, and he is a former faculty and emeritus historian at Meadville Lombard Seminary, one of the two Unitarian Universalist seminaries. For this service, I would like you to think about what being on the margins means and what that might look like. What would it be like if we began to invite those on the margins, whatever that might look like for you, into the center of our community? What would that be like to center the people that we now 
have on the margins, not just in this community, but in the greater community as well. And thinking about that, I would like to share these words by Leslie Takahashi Morris, Marginal Wisdom. They teach us to read in black and white. Truth is this. The rest is false. You are whole or broken. Who you love is acceptable or not. Thinking about the margins. Life tells its truth in many hues. But we are taught to think in either or. To believe the teachings of Jesus or Buddha. To believe in the human potential or a power of beyond a single will. will. I am broken or I am powerful. Life embraces many truths, speaks of both and of and. We are taught to see in absolutes, good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight. But let us see the fractions, the spectrum, the margins. Let us open our hearts to the complexity of our worlds. Let us make our lives sanctuaries to nurture our many identities. The day is coming when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than monochrome that a river of identities can ebb and flow over the static, stubborn rocks in its course, that the margins can hold the center. I would like to invite Christina up to read the chalice lighting words, and then I, I would like to invite Doshia to come up and light our chalice, please. A Community of Faith by Judith L. Quarles. At this hour, in small towns and big cities, in single rooms, living rooms, in ornate sanctuaries, many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. As we light our chalice today, let us remember that we are part of a great community of faith. Please now open your charcoal hymn books to hymn number 38, Morning Has Broken. If you are joining us online, the words will be on your screen. For those in the sanctuary, please stand as you are willing and able.
Well, it's story time. <laughs> and this morning I'm going to be reading the story called Last Stop on Market Street by Matt De La Pena. It's a lovely little book. And it is a winner of the Newberry Medal, a Caldecourt, Caldecott Honor Book, a Coretta Scott King Illustrator Honor Book, a number one New York Times bestseller, and a USA Today bestseller. Quite the little book. I hope you enjoy it. And we're going to once again be talking about those on the margins and building community. Only I can't read it from here, so I'm going to read it from here. And the folks online are going to be able to see it beautifully. And you're not, and I'm really sorry about that. We're going to have to petition for a projector, and then we can do the pictures. So CJ and his grandmother are just popping out of church here, and he says, And CJ pushed through the church doors, skipped down the steps. The outside air smelled of freedom. But it also smelled like rain, and if it was today, it would probably smell like snow, which freckled CJ's shirt and dripped down his nose. He ducked under his Nana's umbrella, saying, How come we gotta wait for the bus in all this rain? Trees get thirsty too, his Nana told him. Don't you see that big one drinking through a straw? CJ looked for a long time, but he couldn't see a straw. From the bus stop, oh, got to turn the page. From the bus stop, he watched water pool on flower petals, watched rain patter against the windshield of a nearby car. His friend Colby climbed in, gave CJ a wave, and drove off with his dad. Nana, how come we don't got a car? It's my book, so I can lick it. What do we need a car for? We got a bus that breathes fire, and old Mr. Dennis, who always has a trick for you. The bus creaked to a stop in front of them. It sighed and sagged, and the doors swung open. So they get on the bus, and Mr. Dennis, the bus driver, he pulls the coin from behind CJ's ear. What's this I see? And he placed it in the boy's hand. Nana laughed her deep laugh and pushed CJ along. They sat right up front. The man across was tuning a guitar. An old woman with curlers had butterflies in a jar. Nana gave everyone a big smile and a good afternoon. She made CJ do the same thing. The bus lurched forward and stopped. It lurched forward and stopped. And if you've ever spent much time on a bus, you know exactly what that means. Lurched forward and stopped. Nana hummed as she knit. How come we always got to go here after church, CJ said. M Miguel and Colby never have to go nowhere. Nana said, I feel sorry for those boys, she told them. They'll never get a chance to meet Bobo or the sunglass man. And I hear Trixie got herself a new hat. CJ stared out the window, feeling sorry for himself. He watched cars zip by on either side, watched a group of boys hop curbs on bikes. A man climbed, oops, that's not helpful. There we go, stay. No, I, it might stay. A man climbed aboard with a spotted dog. CJ gave up his seat. How come that man can't see? 
Some people watch, thank you, Anne-Marie. Some people watch the world with their ears. That's a fact. Their noses, too, the man said, sniffing the air. That's a mighty fine perfume you're wearing today, ma'am. Nana squeezed the man's hand and laughed her deep laugh, pre-COVID. Two older boys got on next. CJ watched as they moved on by and stood in back. And they were sharing an iPod or a, a, a music, you know, like an iPhone or a smartphone. And each one has, in the picture, each one has an earbud in their ear. I sure wish I could have one of those, he said. Nana set down her knitting. What for? You got the real live thing sitting, sitting right across from you. Why don't you ask the man if he'll play, up, play us a song? CJ didn't have to ask. The guitar player was already plucking strings and beginning to sing. To feel the magic of music, the blind man whispered, I like to close my eyes. Nana closed hers too. So did CJ and the spotted dog. And the picture's so cute down here in the bottom, it's the little dog's got its eyes closed. And in the darkness, the rhythm lifted CJ out of the bus, out of the busy street. He saw sunset colors swirling over crashing waves. He saw a family of hawks slicing through the sky saw the old woman's butterflies dancing free in the light of the moon. CJ's chest grew full, and he was lost in the sound, and the sound gave him a feeling of magic. The song ended, and CJ opened his eyes. Everyone on the bus clapped, even the boys in the back. Nana glanced at the coin in CJ's palm. He knew what to do. He dropped it in the man's hat. Last stop of Market Street, Mr. Dennis called. CJ looked around as he stepped off the bus. Crumbling sidewalks and broken down doors, graffiti tack tagged windows and boarded up streets. He reached for Nana's hand. How come it's always dirty over here? She smiled and pointed to the sky. Sometimes, when you're surrounded by dirt, CJ, you're a better witness for what's beautiful. CJ saw the perfect rainbow arcing over the soup kitchen. He wondered how his Nana always found beautiful wherever, wherever he, always found beautiful wherever she looked. He looked around them again at the bus rounding the corner out of sight and the broken street lights still lit up bright and the stray cat shadows moving across the wall. It's a tongue twister, sorry. <laughs> when he stopped, spotted the familiar faces of the people he saw every Sunday, he said to his Nana, I'm glad we came. He thought his Nana might laugh that deep laugh but she didn't. She patted him on the head and told him, me too, CJ, me too. Now, come along. And the picture at the end is of CJ and Nana serving folks that are needing to be fed. It's a lovely little story, a lovely little book, and I can certainly see why it's earned so many awards. I hope you enjoyed it. Our community is, in, <clears throat> excuse me, is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. In addition to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Some are local, some national, some international. For the month of November, 
we are going to share our abundance with the CBC Turkey Drive. There are offering plates by each exit, and you are invited to make a donation at the end of the service. For those of you online, you are encouraged to go to the Edmonton Food Bank website and make a donation there. We thank you for your generosity and support. With our time, our talents, and our money, we support the work of the community and this Unitarian Universalist tradition. Let us join in singing from You I Receive, which is hymn number 402 in your charcoal hymn books. Please open your charcoal hymn books to hymn number 348, Guide My Feet. Again, if you're joining us online, the words will be on your screen. And for those in the sanctuary, please stand as you are willing and able. So let us heart, prepare ourselves for a time of reflection, meditation, prayer. I will first invite you into some centering time and then I will read Eagle Poem by Joy Harjo. I'm going to read it twice. And after a moment of silence, we will sing together hymn number 1037 in your teal hymn books. So called We Forgive Ourselves. I need to have that ready and open myself. Hang on. So the way this hymn works is there's um, the leader, narrator, that will be me, will read and then you will sing a refrain. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. I wonder if we should practice that once, please, Karen. Would you like to play it through once first? One, zero, three, seven. Let's just sing that through a couple of times in preparation for after the meditation. that are online, the words will appear on the screen. 
So after we sing that, you'll be invited to light a candle of joy or concern, and we'll do the same thing. Pick up one of those candles there, light it, light a candle, drop it in the, not drop it, but extinguish it in the little glass of water there. And again, if you're new or haven't been part of this ritual before, just, just don't go first, and you'll be fine. Okay, so now let us begin. I invite you to take a couple of deep cleansing breaths with me. With each breath in, I invite you to think about gathering up all that is life-giving and breathing those things in. And as you breathe out, think about letting go of all those things that no longer serve you. Or as you're breathing in, you could also think about breathing and healing energy and releasing harmful words or thoughts that have been in with you. And with each breath in, know that you are enough. And each breath out, let go of expectations, let go of have-tos, And remember that you are perfect as you are. Eagle poem. To pray you open your whole self, to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more that you can't see can't hear, can't know, except in moments, steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like Eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circles in blue sky, in wind, swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you see ourselves and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in knowing we are made of all this and breathe knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true, within a true circle of motion like eagle rounding out the morning inside us. We pray that it will be done in beauty, in beauty. Eagle poem. To pray, open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know, except in moments, steadily growing, and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circles in blue sky, in wind swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you, see ourselves, and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathing in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe, knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon. Within a true circle of motion, like eagle rounding out the morning inside us, we pray that it will be done in beauty. In beauty. And let's just take a few seconds of silence together. And as we prepare to sing our meditation hymn, Know You Are Beauty, and that we are a people of human frailty, human mistakes, that we hurt 
and we hurt others, and that we are loved. Let us sing together. I will read the words, and you will sing the refrain. We begin again in love. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. For each time we have struck out in anger without just cause. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. For the selfishness that sets us apart and alone. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit. For losing sight of our unity. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which we have fueled, which have fueled the illusion of separateness. And to continue on in this spirit of reflection, gentleness, kindness, and love, I invite you to come and light a, a candle if you so wish. And I would like to invite those in the Zoom room that they could put their joys and concerns into the chat. And I invite others to respond in kindness and in love, celebrate with, other, with those who are putting their joys and empathize with those who have concerns. So I invite you now to light a candle if you so choose.
And Christina will light a candle for her, for herself, and then one more as we hold all of this. Each candle, each flame represents something that we carry, a joy, a concern, a grief, a love, a longing. These are important things. They're not just candles, but we hold them together. That's what we do in community. Thank you. Christina and I were talking yesterday and um, saying how much we miss the spoken candles. But that would have taken a long time, don't you think? And then we would be here till like, you know, noon or after, because I'm still going to preach the sermon, whether you do like 25, 30 candles, I'm still preaching the sermon. So you get to decide how long you want to be here. What Mark said, kind of a funny title for a sermon, isn't it? The first reading this morning is from the book, Been in the Storm Too Long, edited by Reverend, Dark, Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed, no relation, and this little story in this book is by David Eaton. It's called, I See Her From Time to Time. Many people left the church, and some for legitimate reasons. A lot left because they could not stand what I am talking to you about this morning. A woman, 62 years old, came to my office. She was crying. And I got up and went and gave her a hug. And she said, I've got to leave the church. I asked, well, why? She said, I'm just not comfortable anymore. It was all right before when the ministers were white. There were a few black folks, but now there are too many joining the church. I'm not comfortable anymore. I feel ashamed of myself, she said. I'm liberal, and I never thought that I could have racist feelings, but I do. The minister said, I, I, well, you can try to change. You can do some work. And she said, no, I'm too old for that. I, I can't change. When I go to church, I want to be comfortable, but I'll send you some money every now and then to help the church out. And she left. I see her from time to time. She is out in one of those suburban churches. I see her through the corner of my eye. And if she sees me before I see her, she vanishes quickly. And I let her. But if I see her first, she smiles and we hug each other. She asks me how things are, and we quickly part. And I appreciate her honesty. The second reading is by Robin D'Angelo from her book, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And she says, my personal reflections on my own racism, a more critical view of media and other aspects of culture, and exposure to the perspectives of many brilliant and patient mentors of color all helped me to see how the pillars of racism work. It became clear that if I believed that only bad people who intended to hurt others because of race could ever do so, I would respond with outrage to any suggestion that I was involved in racism. Of course, that belief would make me feel falsely accused of something terrible. And of course, I would want to defend my character. And I had certainly had many of my own moments of responding in just those ways to reflect on. I'm wondering if someone can help this uh, new entrance person get a chair. Are you comfortable there or do you need a chair? Oh, you're looking for somebody. Okay. I'll carry on. I came to see that the way we are taught to define racism makes it virtually impossible for white people to understand it. 
given our racial insulation, coupled with misinformation, any suggestion that, are, that we are complicit in racism is a kind of unwelcome and insulting shock to the system. If, however, I understand racism as a system into which I was socialized, I can receive feedback on my, on, on my problematic racial patterns as a helpful way to support my learning and growth. She goes on to say, white progressives can be the most difficult for people of color because to the degree that we think we have arrived, we will put our energy into making sure that others see us as having arrived. None of our energy will go into what we need to be doing for the rest of our lives. Engaging in ongoing self-awareness, continuing education, relationship building, and actual anti-racist practice. And that's the end of the quote. And if you have not read White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, it's a good starting point for us with this hue of facial color. That was the end of the quote. A few years ago, I was shaking hands with folks as they left the church building. A young man of color approached me and asked me, why are there so few people of color in our church? I told him that that was a long answer question and there were people behind him waiting and maybe we could talk about it that week and we did. I think that was when I first really began digging down into this issue. Why are our Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist or Universalist congregations so homogenous? Not only in the fact that most of us are from Western European descent, but that we are mostly middle or upper class, mostly financially secure, and dare I say it, mostly privileged. First of all, I believe I need to stand here and acknowledge my own privilege. I'm white, I'm educated, I'm a landowner, I own a house, um, I'm of settler stock. My paternal grandparents came to Saskatchewan from England at the promise of free land and homesteaded just northeast of Saskatoon. My maternal, my maternal grandparents' families have been in, had been in the United States since the early 1700s and came to Canada in the early 1900s and homesteaded in southern Saskatchewan also on free land. Never in any conversation had I have had with any of my family members was it ever suggested that that land was not free, that it wasn't empty before they tilled the land and started building their houses. My paternal grandparents had to clear the land. It was heavily treed that far north in Saskatchewan. The intergenerational wealth from owning these sections of land has of course benefited my family members. Wealth generated from land that was apparently free and unoccupied, but wasn't. But the government system wished to have settlers come in who were non-indigenous. And so the system and the police force and the legal systems, all the legal systems were set up to support the settlement of Canada from European immigrants. The First Nations people that were there were hidden away on reserves and their children were sent to residential schools and we all know this story. And we know that the system was and still is set up to favor people of my skin tone. I will never be racially profiled. I've never been afraid when I get pulled over by a police officer. And I know because I've been told that racial profiling happens here in Canada as well as in the United States and just as often apparently. So the sermon title this morning is what Mark said. And by Mark, of course, I mean the Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed. Mark was born and raised in Chicago and his family attended First Unitarian Society of Chicago where it was there that he began asking this same question. Why are there so few African-American Unitarian Universalists? He says, the questions arose from my existential situation. 
As an African-American child growing up in the 1950s, I saw so few of my hue that I could not help be conscious of the only other African-American in the children's choir, my first black Sunday school teacher, the UU seminarian who was my youth group advisor. Mark has spent more than half a century answering this question and has produced a huge body of work, and I invite you, encourage you to read some of it. He is now retired and lives north of Toronto. He and his wife, the Reverend Donna Morrison Reed, were co-ministers, as I said before, at our Toronto congregation. He uncovered systemic race, racism, and his, in his history, in his work in the histories, oh, the publications of Universalist and Unitarian churches um, have been coming out for more than a century. And as he went through these publications, he uncovered systemic racism in these publications. He, in his work, he has uncovered the refusal to support initiatives in neighborhoods that were not predominantly white, refusal to ordain and fellowship people of color, our organization, the Unitarian Universalist Association. Everywhere he turned, he found that the Unitarian and the Universalist organizations were bound by systemic racism. The fallout from this, even though our, our, our organizations are trying hard to correct the injustices, is that our congregations have developed and evolved to be less than open to some kinds of diversity. Some congregations have moved further along than, in this than others, but for the most part, our Unitarian Universalist Association and the Canadian Unitarian Council is beginning to examine the biases in our organization and now we are being asked to examine our own personal privilege and the systemic racist water we are swimming in. So what do I mean by that? This water is the culture we are living and breathing in. The way things we have been slanted to make ease things easy for some. Most importantly, no one needs to be a racist to benefit from and be influenced by the system. So it's not that anyone is personally inherently racist. It's simply that it's impossible to not be influenced by it or to have been privileged by it if you're white. Our work is, begin, is to begin to notice it because it's almost invisible. We have to begin to understand the effect it has on our way of thinking, feeling, and being in the world. That is why I believe it is so important to adopt the, eighth, the proposed eighth principle that you are being asked to vote upon. The proposed principle is this. We, the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council, covenant to affirm and promote individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and in our institutions. There are many differing views and opinions. I've heard many, read many, and they are things like, this is a call to action, not a principle. And we already have this covered with the other principles. And I don't get what it means. And so I invite you to go to the Canadian Unitarian Council's website, cuc.ca, and view the information provided. There is a ton of stuff you can read. We need to begin educating ourselves and we need to take personal responsibility for doing so. Even after all of these years, the Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed would still not see many people of his hue in our member congregations. We can we could say that we don't have a lot of African American people here, but we do not reflect the community of Edmonton in the way in our hue. 
we can still say that our congregations are set up to make people of my skin hue comfortable. We can also say that uh, we, as member congregations of the CUC and our larger organization, the Unitarian Universalist Association, have come a long way in recognizing that we have to do something. This eighth principle is not just a principle that we keep in our, the back of our mind and pull out every now and then. And some of them we can't remember. I can't tell you all seven principles, by the way. I'm not that. My memory doesn't hold that, those. So if this eighth principle sounds like a call to action, that is because we need a call to action. We need to begin to understand our part. We need to begin unraveling the threads that have bound us so tightly to the way we traditionally do things and see things. We are being called to be greater than we are right now. If we decide to stop and fuss about wordsmithing, we'll never get to the work that we're actually supposed to be doing. And what is that work, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. That work is figuring out who we are, who is our neighbor, and what are we called to do. There are many reasons we are a member congregation of the Canadian Unitarian Council. And one of them is to discover how we, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, can get beyond ourselves and begin to let our light shine in the community. We have something the world needs. We have inclusion. We have acceptance, community, support, a spiritual home, and, and you, you fill in the blank. These are things that people want. We're hiding our light under a bushel, as they say. We have forgotten how amazingly rare our way of thinking and believing is. And we, like many other UU congregations, we have forgotten that we need to be in community, not just hidden away in our building. So what do you think we are capable of? How do you think this congregation will live into the eighth principle? What is the work we are being called to do together? I don't mean a little thing here and a little thing there, but a congregation-wide understanding of what we are called to do. I think this is going to take us at least a year to figure out. And we will begin, need to begin to understand what our mission and vision is and then work to fulfill our newly and yet not imagined mission in ways that we cannot fathom yet. So while I'm excited about what our, your potential is right now, as we begin, I've only been here two months, our work right now is for us to get to know one another. We're gonna do this right, so let's take some time. First, Let's get this eighth principle on the books. Then, in January, we're going to have a startup weekend with Joan Carolyn, our representative from the Canadian Unitarian Council. She will help us get started on our mission and vision work, and we will be able to set some priorities for our work together. Also, this will be a chance to discuss how things are going so far. And it, we, we believe that's going to be on the weekend of January 21st, so please save that date. We are hoping to have it accessible in person and online so that no one is left out. We need folks to be there. I've covered a lot of bases this morning. But let's boil it down to what we need to take away this morning, what we need to take away today. And this is not going to be the last time I ask these questions. And I want each and every one of us to be thinking of these important questions. Who are we? Who are our neighbors? 
What are we called to do? These questions are too big for us to answer today. But let's keep them in our hearts and minds as we go forth in the weeks and months ahead. Look around. Look around this room. Who are we? And as you go out, look again. Who are our neighbors? And that does not need to be geographical. And then think and feel deeply about what we are called to do. May we take our time to honestly begin examining our own thoughts, feelings, and actions as we begin to answer these questions that I hope will reside in our hearts. Say it with me. Who are we? Who are our neighbors? And what are we called to do? So may it be. Amen. And the Teal Hymn Book. Do we need to take a breath? <sighs> I did. See you, Humbud. Hymn number 1030 in the Teal Hymn Book. Uh, we're going to rock it out, folks, as much as you're willing and able. So um, stand as you're willing and able and sing See You, Humba. I don't care. Um, what's first in the hymn book? Zulu's. Zulu's first. Okay, does, do we need a small, short lesson on how to say this? Or are we good? <laughs> say that again, please. It's just like it looks like. Yeah, it's transliterated for you there, so it should be not too difficult. See ya humba kukaneni kwenkos. That's how I say it. I don't think I'm right. <laughs> but that's how I say it. I've kind of made it easy for myself. See you, Humba, Kukuneni, Quincos. All right, lead us on, Karen.
You go, you do this part. Okay. I would like to invite Dosha back up to extinguish the chal chalice, please. And I'd like to thank Gordon for accompanying on drums. <laughs> we talked about drums, we didn't have drums. Gordon made it happen. All right. <laughs> On the Brink by Leslie Takahasi Morris. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a greater generosity of spirit, a deeper joy in this life we share. And our closing words are by Ella R. Nost. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break, all things can break, and all things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So go and love intentionally. Love extravagantly and love unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you, and you, and you, and you, and you. So go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And now the announcements. The announcements, there's never a good place to put the announcements in a service. There is, like, in the beginning, anyway. So I'd like to thank everyone who participated in this service. And... Uh, there, we have been asked to make a vote for the eighth principle. We as a congregation need to have our voice heard and Susan Rattan will be sending out another email. Look for that and respond if you can, please. If you can wish to continue, if you wish to discuss the eighth principle with me, there'll be a one o'clock Zoom meeting at the same Zoom link for the Sunday service. So I will be on Zoom, I'll open the room and if you would like to discuss it, Casually, respectfully, kindly, hint, hint, we, we will do that. Okay, oh, and I do have sad news to impart. Lila Slizny has passed away uh, this early this morning or over the night last night, and so our hearts and minds and prayers are with Lila's family here and in Calgary. Thank you. Yes, I know. That's right. I know you're related. Thank you, Doshi, for being here. We really appreciate it. And now, our closing linking song, Carry the Flame. Um, carry the flame of peace and love until you meet, we meet again. Are, are there any other words to that, Karen? No, that's what we sing. We kind of stand around, for those who are new here, we kind of stand around in a circle. We used to hold hands. We don't anymore. But you can if you are, you know, married. Oh! I'm sorry, I have another announcement. If you would like to know more about the truth and healing reconciliation, here is the little booklet with the recommendations. It's on the back, by, on the, as back there. Take one if you like. Okay, carry the flame. <laughs>